we don't have any voice at the table. It feels like the voices that have been loudest and, and speaking out for our industry, they don't really consider the small operators. Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to restaurateur Lily Natai Stokes. She is the operations manager at Theodore's, a neighbourhood restaurant in Brunswick, in the inner north of Melbourne. Uh, I've just, I've never actually been to Theodore's, I have to confess, but I feel pretty close to the restaurant, having followed their ins and outs and ups and downs pretty closely through the pandemic. Certainly a restaurant that is very close to its community and uh, Lily really wears her heart on her sleeve in their socials. Um, Lily, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you so much for having me. For people who don't know Theodore's, um, can you just give us a rundown on the type of place that it is and I suppose your intentions as hospitality operators? Absolutely. Um, so Theodore's is, I guess, a neighbourhood wine diner. Um, we started in 2019. It was um, founded by myself and my partner who also works in the restaurant as venue manager, Henry Brooks. Um, we have both had long careers in hospitality and we decided um, after, you know, working our backsides off for other operators that weren't really treating us as fair as we felt we should be, um, we decided to take a leap of faith and open a restaurant of our own um, to try and do things differently to the, I guess, this, you know, the old school ways of some hospitality operators. Um, our intention was to create, yeah, a community um, based around hospitality. So we work with local suppliers um, and we sort of champion seasonal produce and good values and ethics um, with, you know, every product that we sell. Um, we believe in, I guess, anti-capitalist values in the sense that, um, you know, our staff are our business. They are a part of our community and if we don't invest in them, um, then we don't have a business as far as we see it. Um, and that does mean sometimes that we're not making the best business decisions, but we're making the best ethical decisions for, for where we're at. I mean, you know, when you say, well, in 2019, we launched our business, it's just like my heart just <laughs> thinks a little bit for you because, I mean, it's, uh, you know, every operator has done it so tough over the past couple of years, but I suppose for a new business and especially one that's um, founded with values first and foremost and then had your ability to enact those values challenged so significantly, it's, um, I just I just can't imagine this sort of emotional toil that it's taken on you. It's definitely been challenging. Um, it, you know, it's bittersweet because the, we hit the ground running and the response was amazing and we managed to sort of reach so many goals and milestones. So part of that was um, our business model was to include fundraisers every quarter, um, you know, as a way to use our platform to, to give back to the community and we managed to accomplish quite a lot of that in 2019 and very early in 2020 um, and then you know I guess maybe it was because we were still new the energy and the gusto we had to sort of face the pandemic and and that that same I guess morality that we had sort of achieved with the momentum we were able to take that in so we we've tackled you know the last two years as best we can um, but we've managed to do it living by our values and our morals and it's made it all the worthwhile even in those hard times you know it's always felt like it was worth doing mm. well that's i mean that's so nice to hear um because I know that you've tried lots of different things, you know, a bit of a grocery and a, some, a lot of meal packs and, you know, and what are some of the, I don't know if highlights is the right word, but what are some of the real markers along the journey? Um, yeah, I guess, um, like I spoke to you really early in 2020 um, with regards to that initial pivot with, um, you know, I, I recognise that if restaurants and bars were closing, and particularly restaurants that share the same values as us, which is almost every operator in Melbourne these days, um, you know, supporting local farms and getting the freshest, best in-season produce. If those farms were not 
supplying to restaurants because the restaurants had closed, obviously, then that product would be left to rot or go to landfill. And, like, you know, the horror stories in in those early times of um, – it was, like, a really late tomato season, for example, and Chris from Wandan Yalik, um, he hadn't even had the chance to pick the bulk of his heirloom tomato and zucchini crop because – the restaurant closures had occurred before they were ripened. And so he was faced with the decision, you know, do I let it rot on the vine? Do I pay people to pick it? And then I may not even make my money back. Um, so I guess yeah, the highlights in those early days were being able to identify problems and um, weak points with our supply chain and our industry, I guess, as a whole and what it, what it meant when it closed. Um, and again, use our platform and our abilities and connections, our community and customers to keep those supply chains open, um, which was really rewarding. Um, We we rescued those tomatoes and made tons of condiments and posadas and things like that, which we were able to sell through our grocers. So yeah, I guess it was warming that they didn't go to waste and knowing that that those decisions and and whatnot, the, the impact that it had on the growers and the rest of the community um, was really good. We've, you know, contributed to and hosted a bunch of community meals, um, by which I mean sort of just getting donations from suppliers or outlaying the cost ourselves and getting volunteer labour um, to, you know, produce what we could um, for, for free of charge to anyone in need. Um, they were, you know, great seeing, again, just suppliers and other businesses jump on board to contribute to those things. We've had winemakers like Minim donate wine to the public. We've had um, Raf at All Day Donuts. He, you know, one of the community meals contributed donuts to go with them. Um, So, yeah, I guess in the sense of like community and spirit throughout the lockdown has probably been the biggest highlight for us, just knowing that we have positioned ourselves and aligned ourselves with a lot of like-minded people. Yeah, so so nice and so so heartening, and especially when the restaurant, I suppose, was framed as as a community space in the first place to be able to enact that in all kinds of different ways. Um, so, Lily, you know, fast forward to twenty twenty two and this um, very challenging Omicron period. Can you tell us um, where Theodore's is at now? Yeah, so um, I guess going into Christmas, we were hopeful and optimistic um, that after Christmas, you know, those couple of weeks after large gatherings and whatnot, maybe there would be an indication that Omicron was either going to subside or get worse. Unfortunately, it got worse. But I guess in the way that um, the public and also our governments have responded in the past, they've kind of jumped on to sort of community to stop the spread essentially you know they they um that message was loud and clear for the last two years um but in this case it felt like we were moving away from that which we totally have now um and it became about personal responsibility and the onus being on businesses to police um vaccine passports to supply um, rapid tests to staff for peace of mind so that we could actively try to prevent sp- spread in the workplace um, and things like that. And it's, you know, um, it's, it's unfortunately meant that we have had to close the business um, until we know more about what's going to happen with the, the transmission. Now, it's kind of like we were hopeful in the sense that maybe there would be you know, a positive outcome or some restrictions would come back or businesses would be supported in some way, shape or form. Um, But beyond that, I suffer from chronic illnesses and disabilities. So for me, um, it's been, yeah, it's been tough because there's this constant narrative in the media about um, pre-existing or underlying health issues um, as a way to justify what we're seeing is daily death tolls now. And it is to say that, you know, people like myself are disposable um, is really nothing short of eugenics. So, yeah, making the decision to close has been incredibly hard. Um, I recognise my privilege that we have had enough savings to be able to 
weather this storm for a brief period, um, but that hasn't gone without stress. But yeah, the idea that I'm not the only one, um, particularly in hospitality, because there's a bricks and mortar, very face-to-face, um, no mask environment, who has had to make the really tough decision to choose between their livelihood and that of their staff um, and their suppliers and their lives. Essentially, that's the choice that I'm being made to make, it feels. Wow. That's, yeah, it's a lot. Um, I think so often in this conversation about the people with underlying health conditions, it's it's framed as these these other people, these hidden people, these people that we um the, the, these weaker people, but of course, you know, it's, it, it's just, these are just people in our community that, um, that just obviously deserve to be looked after as much as, as anybody else. And I mean, it's, it is, it, I think this reframing of the whole conversation around, you know, case numbers and spread has been so destabilizing for everybody, but I think particularly for, um, people who have, you know, added vulnerabilities, it must have been or it must still be. So uh, just um, what's, the, what's the word? I mean, you, you've probably got more words for it than, than I do, but just demoralising uh, feelings of abandonment, uh, feelings of being made less of. Well, it's, it's interesting because, yes, these are, all, these are all incredibly accurate ways that describe how the disabled community feels. Um, I'm in a few like online spaces and, and real life groups, um, which have obviously moved to online spaces p- predominantly in the last two years. Um, and it's it, these are all very accurate ways to describe how we feel, but these are ways that this community has felt for a long time, like pre-pandemic as well. Um, and it's it's such an interesting time for us all because. It's bittersweet because it's a stark contrast to the beginning of 2020 um, when it seemed like the abled community really embraced um, adapting and moving to online spaces, which made so much more accessible to the disabled community. Um, And now not only has that kind of been revoked from us um, and things have kind of gone back to normal for some people or people that feel confident in you know, the protection of um, vaccines, which we're all incredibly grateful for, you know, speaking on behalf of a lot of my disabled friends, because um, we, you know, it it helps us, it protects us, but the more people that do it in our community has also helped us. So there's always been this sort of like, (laughs) I guess, hope that when we reach those vaccine targets, which the... um, the roadmap was more or less based off and we'd been, you know, so grateful for you keeping us updated with the um, rules around what we are and able aren't, and aren't able to do um, with reopening and restrictions and things like that. But what the roadmap didn't consider is, yeah, the most vulnerable people in our community. And it sort of seems as though when it went to the feds and they sort of um, – like the lack of contact t- tracing that's now occurring and the downgrading of the contact types, um, it shifts the onus onto our friends and family and our support networks to take extra precautions, which is it's just a massive ask and it's a huge responsibility um, and it's creating so much anxiety. And the financial undertaking as well, that to, to be constantly taking rapid tests, um, if we can even access them, <laughs> Um, and then also knowing that they aren't 100% reliable. It's sort of just like it's um, put us back into isolation but with this, all these additional challenges. So it's, yeah, it's it's been a journey <laughs> and I have to say that this is probably the lowest point um, from the conversations that I've been having with, yeah, friends and, and acquaintances in the same sort of situation. Mm, it's. Yeah, it's just it, it's a massive added burden. And so, Lily, you've had to let go of your staff, like the staff that you've tried to carry through to, here to here, until now. Well, I'm so grateful that my staff are incredibly understanding of the situation that we're in, and that it is um, tougher than say 
able-bodied people and people with perfect health or, you know, <laughs> they, um, they, we, we organized a, I organized a GoFundMe, I should say, um, not to anyone's request, but that was the biggest thing for Henry and I when it came to deciding whether or not we should close and, and try and protect my health or stay open and, and like it would have been a nightmare because we've got a four-year-old son and we were trying to organise whether or not he could isolate elsewhere if he wanted to work so that I wasn't coming into contact but then the care of our son and the hours and, and whatnot, it just like it couldn't have worked. So when we sat down with our staff and explained the situation, they were more or less asking me <laughs> to please take a time out and they were happy for us to close and they've all sort of found given that there is an insane shortage of hospitality staff across the industry um, when we made a post to announce that we had decided to close for a little while um, and then I also included the the community GoFundMe which raised some funds just to cover basic living expenses for our small team which was incredibly great like incredibly heartwarming and also encouraging and so many other operators um, hospitality operators were in our DMs and comments encouraging us to do this and saying that we were, you know, brave and responsible. And so it just that felt right. But yeah, in, in answer to your question, all of our staff were um, picked up to do casual shifts from our neighbours. So we share um, a back sort of waste area with our neighbours good days and NAM has offered all the front of house staff shifts. Um, as well as, you know, prep and whatnot. And the gospel whiskey guys have helped out with bottling um, shifts and Lawrence, um, who is actually our wine buyer and similia is a winemaker at Dirty Black Denim. So um, he's, you know, had bottling shifts and stuff like that as well. So these are all sort of environments where, you know, staff can slot in pretty easily, but they're all wanting to come back and work at theatres when we are safe to reopen. What would you like to see from, you know, in terms of policy or, or government, um, you know, to make things better for you? And given that I suspect none of the things that you wish to happen will happen, what do you, how do you see things rolling out over the next weeks and months? Um, I honestly think it's just a waiting game at this point. We have made the decision to not think about it for stress and health reasons until like a week or so after school's back because I think that that'll be a like an indicator as to what's happening with the transmission particularly um, because it just creates a lot more movement and interaction with classrooms and school environments um, and travel and things like that but we yeah we just kind of have to wait and see um, essentially I'm on the precipice of, you know, one of my chronic conditions turning worse, which is being impacted by stress. So we are just biding our time and accepting that this is the current state of things. Um, and I'm just waiting to see what happens, but in terms of what I would like to happen, um, with regards to policy, I think that it is such a systemic issue um, that, you know, this, this one scenario probably doesn't even come close to the difficulties that people with disabilities and health issues in this country really face. And um, I don't know how much you want to get into it, but essentially like as someone that's navigated health systems through their entire life um, and never actually been successful for any support or welfare from the government, I've kind of had to advocate for myself within my workplaces to meet my needs. So I've been incredibly fortunate that I have the skills to do that and that I've, you know, come as far as I have. But access to the systems that are currently in place to support people with health issues are incredibly hard to navigate you have to be so cognitively capable to discern all the information and requests that are made of you to complete an application. And then it really does depend on who you're talking to, which information you're given. 
it's as though, I hate to say it, but it's as though you need, like if you're not able to advocate for yourself, you need someone to help you. And the, the irony in that is that most people are applying for these support so that they can have someone to aid them. So, yeah, exactly. So I just wish that um, now more than ever, they, instead of what the federal government is doing, which is scrapping, you know, Medicare left, right and centre and the NDIS is in shambles, I just wish that given that, you know, it's such a unique and severe situation, I wish that they would, uh, I don't know, increase accessibility, increase aid to to get to it and that, like just as a start so that people whose health issues are impacting their ability to make a living, um, they would have something to lean on. Yeah. I mean, it, it, as you say, like there's so much to it and it does, it is very systemic and embedded in all kinds of different elements of society. But, you, I mean, there's a perhaps... I don't know, a couple of causes for hope, like the fact that wheelchair athlete Dylan Olcott's recently been named Australian of the Year. I mean, there's going to be a lot of high-profile um, attention on some of the issues, and I really look forward to hearing from him a lot. Um, I must admit, I got quite teary when I saw that he was announced as the Australian of the Year. It did. It raised a lot of positive emotions. <laughs> good. Well, that's good. I mean, he's an incredible advocate and, um, yeah, like a super charismatic person. I really hope that he's able to create the change that I'm sure he wants to. And, I mean, I wonder also, you know, the the fact that there are such dire staff shortages, you know, employers and organisations have to be creative and um, find, yeah, other ways to uh, people their businesses and I think there are some employers um, you know not perhaps I haven't heard of any huge examples in hospitality but perhaps there are some I'd love to hear if you're out there who are you know looking at uh, different ways of um, you know creating and maintaining and nurturing a workforce you know hopefully people will just um, be more creative and and uh, offer the supports that they need to uh, yeah open up opportunities to more people in our community yeah I think I think that there's a lot of great organizations in place that are sort of um like a lot of non non for profits rather that front that burden that the government doesn't seem to want to touch but um with regards to hospitality in particular I just think like people a lot of people that suffer from chronic illness like they just can't be exposed it's I don't know if you've seen that meme going around on Instagram but um, it's it's text on a background that says, I don't want to be a bitch, but I really don't want to get sick. And I think the one thing that I haven't mentioned today is that um, uh, fibromyalgia, which is a condition that I have, was actually caused um, as a post-viral illness. I had a relapse of glandular fever about six years ago, um, which continued to develop into fibromyalgia, which is a condition that isn't really, like there's not a lot of information about it, but what I do know is that um, like it's it affects you neurologically. So the idea of anyone comfortable with potentially getting long COVID, which studies out of America I think are saying that, you know, 30% of cases are experiencing long COVID and, you know, some of that is short-lasting but some of it, hasn't resolved yet um, and, and to know that this could be a mass disabling event as well as a pandemic. You know, glandular fever's been around for eons but we're only just finding out that there's these conditions like chronic fatigue and um, fibromyalgia which are coming out of that. Like it's just an – it really is. Um, so, yeah, with regards to like hospitality and other bricks and mortar businesses, it's really hard to adapt to like, you know, not have people interacting with potentially more vulnerable staff, which, yeah, unfortunately has meant that us and like we've got um, friends who've got a place down in St Kilda called Good Love. They've closed till March. My friend who's a hairdresser who's immunocompromised, she can't work until the foreseeable future. It's just, yeah, there's a lot of industries and hospitality is one of them where adapting 
you know, roles and, and whatnot is more challenging because it is such a physical and face-to-face environment. And, Jimmy, you, know, you, you acknowledge, you know, the fact that you, you're lucky enough to have savings to get you through and, you know, hopefully they'll last for however long this period does. Um, but, of course, so many people don't and there must be a lot of people who are going to work terrified every day um, where it seems like a lot of people are quite cavalier about the possibility of, of catching and contracting COVID. Um, uh, you know, many, many people just simply cannot, um, like it's just, yeah, like for yourself, like it's just not a, not okay. You can't take that risk. No way. And it's probably a good time to raise the, the fact that um, we are seeing unions and, and whatnot speak out against it in terms of other industries. But, you know, one of the, the other reasons why hospitality has been, I don't know, like corrupt (laughs) for such a long time is because we don't have a union. So even at a sort of like um, government level, we don't have any voice at the table. It feels like the voices that have been loudest and, and speaking out for our industry, they don't really consider the small operators. It's, you know, kind of Crown Casino and Uber Eats, you know, it feels as though they're the voices that are loudest at the table when it comes to making decisions around our industry. Yeah, that's really interesting because I guess the Restaurant and Catering Association, which does represent a lot of hospitality businesses, I mean, they do have a seat at some tables at least, but perhaps they're not talking about these things, like these these kind of broader... Yeah, they, they, def- they definitely don't. Um, and I don't know if you remember earlier in the pandemic when the Restaurant and Catering Association was, um, you know, coming up, I think, with a roadmap or, you know, they were, they were involved in some decision-making process. Um, they were also like, they, I don't know, there was a promotion for to get members which um, directly benefited Uber Eats. It was as though like, yeah. Oh, that's right. It was, you, you'd get a discount on the commission if you signed up to restaurant and catering. Yeah, that didn't go down well with everybody. That's that's fair to say. I think it's also, you know, it's a business, it's an organisation for business owners. You're obviously, you obviously are a business owner, but perhaps, you know, um, as you've as you've expressed, like your, your values may not be the same as some other businesses. The way I see it, that's the shift that's happening in hospitality and that's the way that it should be going. It's But, like, because hospitality owners are the way that we are, like, so stressed because it's, you know, we've got all these issues that we've discussed today but not to mention everything else that you've probably discussed um, with other guests over the the last few weeks. Um, But, you know, operators like myself, we're not the minority anymore, at least in our networks. Like, you know, Jack Shaw, who's got Hope Street Radio and Nagesh at Manze and um, Zoe from Poodle, like... These are all incredibly like-minded individuals that are just like me. They want hospitality to be great and good for everyone and healthy. Um, And it would be nice if, I don't know, at some stage we can get our act together and actually find a way. Like in Sydney, because I worked in hospitality in Sydney for a number of years too, um, my networks up there created the Nighttime Association, which was an organisation of small business owners that uh, took on their state government and overturned the lockout laws, which is incredible. Um, And like, you know, if I had the capacity to, um, this is something that I would probably be using this time to achieve. Um, But as I said, I have to be mindful of my stress at the moment. Um, So yeah, down the track, it's absolutely you know, something that I and I know another of like another number of small operators would be interested in doing is actually creating an organisation um, that had a voice for the future of hospitality. Well, I think, you know, this Omicron shit show, you know, if it's if it's done anything good, it might be to make it really undeniable that the that business is people and that as much as you can have a, you know, uh, 
unlock hospitality vibe. Let's, you know, we have to open up, we have to open up um, sort of philosophy. It's like, well, if you open up and, <clears throat> you know, the whole workforce becomes unwell or, or, or is in isolation, then, you know, unlocking didn't really work out very well for business or people. Um, so, you know, perhaps perhaps there will be a bit more of a sort of coalescence of views around the um yeah, the centrality of, of really looking after everybody that works in these businesses to make them get yeah, for them to be able to thrive. Yeah, I really do hope so. Um, I mean, it's if nothing, it's at least pulled back the curtain on a lot of issues um, across hospitality and, and, you know, its supply chains as well as the community at, at large. So, yeah, I do think that it's a... You know that old saying where, like, you can only like once you reach rock bottom, you can only go up from there. Like, perhaps you know this is the hardest thing that our industry will ever face, but maybe it then leaves room for a better way forward. Yeah, I hope so too, Um, Lily. It's been amazing to speak to you. I think your perspective is so important. Um, Is there anything else that you'd like to say? No, just again, thank you for having me and. It's like, yeah, my heart goes out to everyone that is being impacted by this and I hope you, you know, can get something from this chat today and come to theatres when we're back. (laughs) Yes, I'm definitely coming. I can't wait. Uh, It'll be a big celebration when you are able to reopen. Um, All the best. Um, Yeah, I wish you uh, many deep, calm breaths and... Um, yes, some fortifying food and whatever whatever you need to get through this period. Um, but thanks so much for sharing some time with us today. I appreciate it, Lily. Thank you. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic Get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.